Thank you for the very wonderful session. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our supporters. As title presenter, we have Surya Nepal Gatha, promoter, Pokhara Metropolitan City. Co-promoters, Gondagi Pragya Pratishthan, Buddha Air, Hyundai Lakshmi, Green Development Bank. Sub-promoters, Rashtriya Banija Bank Limited, Global IME Bank. Session presenters, Rupa Gaupalika, Avya Club, Nepal Telecom, Civil Aviation Authority of Nepal, Machapuchre Bank, Lakshmi Sunrise Bank, Salesbury, Barakari Media, Parachute Natural Shampoo, Poiche Publication, Nobil Bank, USAID NDI, Nepal Airlines, Agricultural Development Bank, Partners, Literary Libation Partner Kukri, Knowledge Partner Gate, Event Tech Partner Dreamcast, Internet Partner Vianet, Scan Partner Rebel, Hospitality Partner Hotel Sarovar, Creative Partner Vichitra, Sound Partner Shiva Sound, Decor Partner The Stagecraft. In the next session, Janice Perriot and Pratibha Tuladhar will talk on Everything the Light Touches, a novel by Janice Perriot. Janice Perriot was born in Assam and grew up in Shillong, Meghalaya. Boats on Land, her debut collection of short stories, won the 2013 Shahitya Academy Young Writer Award for the English Language and the 2013 Crossword Book Award for Fiction. Her latest book, Everything the Light Touches, was listed as one of the notable books of 2023 by The New Yorker, the world's finest magazine. Pratibha Tuladhar is a journalist, educator, and communication worker based in Kathmandu, Nepal. She has been teaching writing to photojournalists at the Asian Center for Journalism at the Ateneo de Manila University, Philippines, for the last 12 years. She also teaches journalism at the Communications University of Zhejiang, China, for the University of Bolton, UK. She writes for Nepali Times. In the past, she has written for German press agency DPA for the Kathmandu Post and has produced short videos for BBC Media Action, National Geographic, and the China Daily. Her works also appear in the Nepal Earthquake Anthology and the Harvest Moon, poems and stories from the edge of the climate crisis, a collection of poetry, photographs and stories by writers from Africa, the Pacific, and Latin America. I would like to welcome Janice Perriot and Pratibha Tuladhar on stage. Good afternoon. Okay, it's working, right? Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for um, being present here this afternoon. Um, I've been peeved about this for days because I kept wondering, okay, we are going to do this in English and I don't know how many people will show up. Um, but it's really nice to see all of you sitting here, some of you who just arrived from Kathmandu this morning. So thank you. Um, so I have the pleasure of presenting Janet Perriot to you. Um, she's an amazing speaker. And I actually only met her a couple of hours For ago. Lunch. No, like an hour ago. But I feel like I know her already because I met her through her Instagram, but mostly through this book of hers, which I really loved reading. Um, Thank so you. I give you Janice. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's lovely to be here, by the way. It's my first time in Nepal. It's my first time in this beautiful, beautiful town in Pokhara. And I'm so thrilled to be here. This book is a book about many travelers. And I feel as though every time I, I speak about it in a new place like this, it just gains new energy somehow. So thank you so much for choosing to spend a little bit of your, this beautiful afternoon with us. So Janice, you um, arrived here yesterday and it yes. was sort of a long, tiring journey for you. And also going back to where you hail from, you come from Shillong, which is like uh, the wettest place in India, right? And then you're in the world. 
in the world, sorry, yes. And you've made this journey to Pokhara, which we also think of as the wettest place in the country. So should we begin with uh, sort of recapping your journey a little bit and sharing what, you, what are your first impressions of arriving here? Oh my goodness. I mean, first of all, it feels like home but a little different and that is what is so exciting and so thrilling about uh, being in a place that is so close to home but may not be exactly home. Um, we landed at the airport and I was telling uh, Sam, my partner, that it reminds me of our airport back in Shillong which is also ringed by hills. Um, so there are so many resonances and so many echoes already and I'm really looking forward to spending a little bit more time here and getting to know um, you know the place its geography its beautiful surroundings um, much much more and yes it was a bit of a long journey but it was entirely worth it I hope you have a pleasant stay here and I hope you interact with um some of the people in the audience, which you've actually already started doing, but also discover some great places to eat at. Um, and now we're going to dive into the book. So um, I'm going to just hold the book up. Um, so I, just, I was saying this to Janet earlier, how um, you know sometimes you find a book that you really like, but you do not like the cover. And then what I usually do is I cover it with something else because I don't want to look at the cover, but I really love the book. But with this, I had a completely different feeling because the moment this book arrived in my hands, I completely fell in love with the book for how it looks, how it feels, and I'm usually really intimidated by the size of books, and this is a really big book. But it's such, such a lovely book to hold, and then the design is really great too, so I thought, Perhaps we can begin by talking about the process of how yes. the book came together physically. Yes, of course. That's such a lovely question because we often uh, don't really talk about the physical form of a book, right? We talk about the themes and metaphors and we talk about language and we talk about style and those are very, very important things, of course, to discuss. But thank you for asking about the physical form of the book as well. Um, I remember when the book was first delivered to me at my little apartment in, in Delhi, I opened the box and I picked up the book and I thought, oh my God, this is huge. Who is going to read this? It's really quite big and heavy. And up until then, I'd only ever encountered my book as a PDF on a screen, right? And I'd never really thought of actually how that PDF might translate into physical form and it took this form and it suddenly felt quite intimidating even to me, I have to admit, Pratiba, so you're not alone there. Um, I was very, very lucky, very, very fortunate because this is not the experience of, of, of everyone, of all writers. Um, that I had some kind of collaborative part to play in bringing the cover to life. Um, so usually the publishing house who's publishing your book will send you an email and say, here's your cover and we hope you like it. And you know, that ends the discussion there. But I was very lucky that they were open to some kind of collaborative um, work on the cover and so we decided that it had to be some shade of green because it's a book about our relationship to the natural world, to trees, to forests, um, to the green that gives us life, right? Um, and if you open the book just a few pages in, you'll see that there's a quote by one of the characters who was a real historical person. He actually did live um, and, and, and did all of these, all of the things that, that I've, I've outlined in his story. Um, but he, his quote is, and you, 
understand why when you read the book, his quote is all is leaf. And the quote is by a German poet and playwright who you may already be familiar with. Um, his name is Goethe and he wrote a lot of poetry, a lot of plays in the, 17, the late 1700s, the early 1800s in Germany. But he was also a scientist. He was also a botanist and he had this marvelously curious eye about the natural world. Um, he was very attentive to plants, to flowers, to trees. And he saw in everything this innate connection. And so the book, the leaf on the cover, alludes to the quote that you encounter just a few pages in, but also on a larger, more metaphorical level, it's alluding to how everything is connected. Yeah. So to set the tone, do you think uh, we could begin by reading the invocation? There's an yes. invocation to storytelling in the yes, beginning. Yes, there is, the there right, is. So. Um, so, right at the beginning, there is, a, as Pratibha so beautifully puts it, there's an invocation. And it's an invocation that, for me, works as the voices of a collective, the voices of a people, the voices of the earth, the songs of the earth, right? Um, so it, it functions for me as, as much more than a prologue. A prologue sounds a little bit boring and a little bit insufficient. Um, it works as an opening, as a welcoming, as an invitation to take heed, to tell stories, to connect with nature, to be in the world in a way that is meaningful to you. Yeah. Um, so it begins with the call to listen. Let us wait. Let us listen. We tell the story often, and in the telling, it is different every time. But that, you see, is the nature of stories. There is always a tree always a tiger, always a small bird that knows the secrets of the forest and helps humankind. The rest, the rest is smoke that never curls the same way twice. We tell this story around a hearth. Come, gather by the fire. What will it be tonight? A tale of moral caution, say the elders, of reaching too far, too high. But the children, the children plead for something lighter, where giants turn into mountains and their baskets into boulders. No, say the lovers, tell us about the man who played the flute amidst the branches, so sweet, so clear, and won the heart of the queen. Tonight, tonight we tell the tale of creation, the one in which a tree is a golden ladder linking earth to sky. Why, ask the children, why? So that the first tribes of our celestial people could wander freely working their fields below until the evening, climbing up to rest in the house of God at night. Listen, listen now to how the tree, this tallest in the world tree, was felled. How seven tribes were rendered earthbound, how its branches smacked the lands of the south, laying them flat and rich with the mulch of foliage, how the trunk crashed and carved our hills. Look, look how they bear the mark through all the ages still. Listen, listen, for a story told once may not be told again. 
Thank you, Janice. It's, I feel like it's such a treat just listening to her read because you have this way of really bringing your words to life. And of course, um, I think it's the author who understands their own words better than anyone else, right? That's so so you kind. Have that way Thank of you. really, I think, breathing soul into the words that you've put together. Um, one thing that really struck me when I was reading the book was, so it's lyrical prose, um, and I felt like every single sentence in the book comes from a depth that's been, um, it's, it's basically poetry, but I felt like every single sentence has been put a lot of thought into. And then um, you said in some of your interviews previously um, that it was a long process writing this book, that it took you 10, ten years, years, right? So um, I've been wondering, what, what was the process of the writing for you? Because I also read that the, the idea of the book germinated when you were sitting in a garden, right? So who did Janice become from the day you were sitting in that garden? <laughs> thinking about writing this book to 10 years later, or let's say like now, like what did the process of writing everything the light touches, has, what, has it, what has it done to you? Right, that's such a good question and such an important question because the books that we write change our own lives as much as we hope that they can be transformative for the ones who encounter them after, right? Um, so just to pick up on the, the little observation that you made in the, the first part of your question, which is about the lyricality or the poetry of, of the language, I think it stems very much from the fact that I come from a community of oral storytelling traditions. I come from Shillong, from Meghalaya. We never had a script. We didn't need one. We did really well, actually, with our songs and our stories and our poetry and our performances and our music, until, of course, um, the Christian missionaries, um, you know, uh, landed up and thought, hang on a minute, how do we translate the Bible and spread the word of God if we don't have a script, if we don't have a local script? So they invented a script for us. But our roots and our heart and our soul is very much in the oral, very much in the spoken and the sung. And because of that, Kasi, if you listen to someone speak Kasi, it sounds very musical. There's a great emphasis on rhythm, on rhyme, on pacing. Right? So it's something that even though I write in English, I wish so much that I was proficient enough to write in Khasi, but a lifetime of Anglophile <laughs> education has done its damage. Um, so I try and imbibe that musicality in English that I find so much in Khasi. So whenever I write, for me, writing is as much a process of listening as it is reading. So I will read everything, every sentence out loud, and I will listen to it and see how it sounds and whether the pacing of the sentence is correct to my ear. Because I think we live in a world where language feels like it exists outside us. It's on a screen, it's on a computer, it's on our phones. But language, we must remember that language is breath. It is originally sound. And I feel as though we need to claim that back and to re-embody language and to think about how words sound and how they come across, not just for fiction, but even in our, in our lives, right? Um, so the musicality, the poetry comes very much from there, from, I would hope, this deep awareness of how language exists far beyond the page, right? Um, but writing this book, as you might see, it's, it's a bit of a big book, um, it really changed me, as much of a cliche as that might sound. So it's a book that asks, many questions, but 
one of the most imp important questions, one of the most central questions in the book is, how do we know the world? Through what means do we learn about the world? And for me, this is an important question because how you learn about something determines your relationship with it. How you learn about a person, a plant, a place, how you learn about it determines how you relate to it. And so it was, for me, also a process of unlearning a lot of the ways in which I had been taught to learn about the world, right? We went to very particular schools, we went to very particular universities where we are taught the pedagogy is very, very particularly Western-centric, right? So in a science classroom, when you're learning about physics or botany or biology, we learn about the living world in a very particular way. Goethe, who's one of the characters in the book, and um, Shai, who's another character in the book, who comes, like me, from the northeast of India, offer us a way of seeing the world that is in resistance to this particular very Eurocentric, very Western-centric way of, of being, right? Which can be, tends to be quite analytical, tends to be quite uh, based on, um, on competition, on, on, on order of a very particular kind. So once, in some ways, you let that go, at least for me, once I let that go, it was really about being in the world in a way that allowed the world to be as it is. There was no need to control, to exploit, to intervene in the world in the way that you know, learning about it had taught me. Um, it is a gentler way of being. And I'll give you a little example from the pandemic. I was writing this book during the pandemic, during COVID. And for, for, for so many of us who were privileged enough to have a house and a home and a roof over our heads during the pandemic, it was a time of constriction. We couldn't really move, we couldn't travel. And it was a strange stillness, a strange enforced stillness where you felt, a lot of us felt quite disconnected from family, from friends, from partners, from the world. But I had a little garden in the front of my very you know, tiny apartment in Delhi. I had an even tinier green space. And because the gardener couldn't come in, I had to take over as, as as the head Mali, as the, as the, as the gardener. And I, I, I tried to keep as many plants as I could alive, but it was quite difficult because I had to learn a new language. I had to converse with these living beings in a way that I really hadn't before. I had to pay attention. I had to ask do you need more light? Do you need more shade? Do you need more water? Do you need less water? Um, what is it that you need today? And this, I think, opened up for me a way of conversing with the world that I hadn't quite ever been aware of before. And the other epiphany, the other learning that I had while um, in this time, in this moment, was that my the plants in my little garden, even though they're immobile, they can't move. I mean, we don't really see plants moving physically from place to place. They were still connected to the world. They were still connected to the universe in that every shift of season affected them, every shift of light, of wind. And even in that stillness, there was connection. And I thought that was something that was really important for me, for us to learn, that there is the potential for transformation even in this gentle stillness. And I think that for me has been 
the most transformative um, journey. And it happened while I was writing this book, but I think also it's a process of duality where you are looking at the world in a certain way because you're writing about it, but you're also writing about it because you're looking at the world in a certain way. You can't really separate the two. So can we say that while your characters were also going through that process of transformation, like out, outside of you, right? Because you're creating them right there um, in your words. You were also going through transformation inside yourself very in the process much. of writing it. Yes, very much. I would imagine that this happens to many, if not all, writers. That writing a book changes you. Um, I think it should change you because you are not the same person that you were when you started out. That you have been moved and you've you've been challenged. I would hope to always change when I write a book because the book is challenging me to be a new person and a new writer you know, all the time. So everything the light touches is a historical novel, right? And it has so many things in it. Um, it has a lot of nature in it. Um, it has taxonomy. It has um, colonialism. It has post-colonialism. It has indigeneity. Um, and it really goes into depth into nature and indigenous science and all of these things that's so relevant to us because as all of us like, grapple with uh, climate change, we're also starting to think about what are the ways of going back to what our ancestors taught us, right? And I feel like right in there lies um, the idea of um, documenting oral history and storytelling in the form that it used to be in the past. And so it just makes me wonder with, uh, because you talk about schooling as well earlier, you know, so when we go to schools, we are taught to do things a certain way, tell stories a certain way, form certain perceptions of the world around us. And in that is a whole, um, um, like a series of storytelling going on right there. But then there's also this other form of storytelling that we gather from the community, from people around us, neighbors, the world around us in general, right? So um, would you like to um, sort of go a little bit into like storytelling influences um, uh, as a child, like what kind of influences did you have as a child and um, as you grew up, like what were some of these influences that has made you the writer you are today? Right. Okay, thank you for that question. You know, I, I do get this one particular question quite a lot, as do most other writers, I'm sure, where, you know, you're asked very earnestly, who were your earliest literary influences, right? And I will always say that <laughs> as much as I loved reading as a child, um, I think I became a writer because I was a listener, first and foremost. So as I was saying earlier, I come from a co community of oral storytellers. Um, you know, we sing, we tell folk tales, we... We, we, we talk, there's a lot of yathokhana that happens, which means sitting around, telling stories, right? So favorite pastime. So my earliest, earliest literary influences were these storytellers, and they wouldn't have written a, a book in their lives. Some of them didn't even know how to read or write but they told marvelous stories. You would sit around the fire with them and you would not be able to move. You'd not be able to leave because they would craft a tale in such a way that kept you there, that held you there, held you captive, right? Um, so it's the equivalent of a page turner of a book, I suppose you could say, right? So for me, these would be my earliest influences and I think it's really important to bring this up not just for me as you know as a person as a writer but also because I feel that our, I, our understanding and our definitions of the literary are quite narrow 
I think that if we expanded the idea of literature to include oral storytelling traditions, we would be so much the richer for it, right? Um, you know, if you make a map of, of uh, well, India, that's where I come from. If you make a map of India and you say, okay, these are the literary hubs of India. It would be Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, you know, Calcutta, all of these big cities. But where I come from, the Northeast, you know, the, the little bit that almost falls off the map, really, um, it, it looks like a region of darkness. But that's not true. You know, yes, we have writers. And we have perhaps more writers now than we did before. But we have incredible storytellers. And if we had a literary map that included those forms of storytelling, what a rich and abundant map that would be. So I think for me, this is something that I carry into my writing space, my teaching space, this, this um, need and this necessity to build bridges between the spoken and the written, right? It's, it's, it's exceedingly important. So if we look at the history of um, indigenous people worldwide, we see that um, languages have been lost. And with that, stories have been lost. Forms of knowledge as yes, well. Yes, forms of knowledge, right? And you have this anecdote in the book um, where you talk about these two men who are trying to cross the river and um, this one guy it's who is also... It's a folk tale, yes. Yes, it's a folk tale who's, uh, who represents the indigenous uh, person, right? So how he eats up the script because uh, so that's that, his way of yes, surviving. Yes. And across the region, I think if we really examine the way uh, languages have been carried over, over the centuries, um, we have similar anecdotes in other groups as well. Like if we talk about the Akha people from uh, like n northern China, so Akha people, when they fled, they moved to Burma and then eventually settled in Thailand. But then they have the story about how um, their, story, their scripts were written on buffalo hide. And because when they were fleeing, they were so hungry, they had to boil their own script and eat it. So they say, we're a people who eat our own language. So, and that seems to be the truth for many indigenous communities across the world because uh, of how they've had to flee and all that. Because so, of how they've been colonized, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And... and um, so I'm just wondering now with how we've seen like a spurt in storytelling by people from indigenous communities, how do you think that landscape, or do you think that landscape is starting to change? Because last couple of years, I've seen a lot of literature written by um, like the many that I am by Zuban, which is a collection of short stories by women from Nagaland, right? They and then there's theory. Bitter Worm. Yeah, like all these... Uh, uh, writings that have just come up. How do you think that changed how we think about indigeneity and colonialism in South Asia? Yeah, well, I think it's a narrative and 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 a collection of stories that have been often ignored or silenced because people literally had their language taken away from them or their form of telling taken away from them, right? So from where I come from, for example, for the longest time, we were not allowed to celebrate, under the British, we were not allowed to celebrate our own festivals. We were not allowed to play our own music. So Khasi traditional instruments were banned. And this was our heartbeat, no? This was the way that our stories lived and the way that we danced and celebrated and gathered and bonded. So you were really ripping at something molecular here, cellular. So if you don't have that music, you don't have that festival, those stories are not told, they're not celebrated, they're not passed on. So for so long, there has been silence. Actually, the language of colonization so often is silence. Because you do not have, as a colonized subject, the space to speak, to sing, to tell stories. And 
even though, of course, it's been several decades that, you know, um, um, colonialism has ended, so, so to speak, um, where, of course, new forms of colonization have taken place. Um, but I feel that it's only now that there is some kind of um, acknowledgement and perhaps uh, an ear that is being lent to stories about indigeneity. And I think there could be more. There could be more space. There could be more um, conversations like these um, to allow people to really um, reclaim, to re-empower. Um, but I think also why this has shifted even in the minuscule way that it has is because we are living at a time of such deep and dangerous ecological crisis. And there has been, I think, an understanding that we cannot continue this way, that there has to be a relearning um, at some level of ways of being that do not endanger us and the planet in this way. And where does that resource come from? It comes from indigenous forms of knowledge, indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous ways of being in the world that are gentler, that are less intrusive, that are less exploitative. Um, and I think within that reckoning of how um, indigenous forms of knowledge can help us perhaps see this crisis through. We're not sure. We're not sure how it's going to, do, to go. Um, but I think within that space of, of opening up to indigeneity as, a, as an important resource and form of knowing, there has been space crafted for more of their stories, right? Um, and we'll see. I feel as though sometimes we are expected to know what's going to happen, but we, we don't. Right? And we have to see how this unfurls and how this, this goes. But we're sitting here talking about it, so that's a good start. <laughs> that's a good start. Um, yeah, it seems like India is going through a new form of colonization, or so it seems to us from where we're sitting. Um, and you talked about how the Northeast is like a hidden part of the country. So I'm just wondering, for you, as an artist, as a writer, um, how comfortable are you? Are you, are you able to make your work with comfort? Um, and how does the role of artists play out in a situation like that where um, doing your work might be challenging? I'm just saying this out of assumption, yes. but I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah. yeah, no, there's been sadly, unfortunately, tragically even a trend in the last 10 years or so in, uh, in India, uh, given the current political scenario and with the current government in power, there has been a shutting down of safe, free spaces for people to voice dissent, for people to voice protests. As we speak, our farmers are protesting for their livelihoods at the borders of Haryana and Delhi and being met with terrible, terrible violence on the part of the state. And honestly, you can't look at that incident or this, this circumstance in isolation because it, it has rippling effects on other spaces, right? Other spaces of protest and dissent. Um, as a fiction writer, to be honest, um, because so few people <laughs> read us, um, I don't know if there's, if, if there's been that kind of direct and pressing um, you know, pressure. Comedians have felt it, journalists, so people who are writing nonfiction have felt it much more than fiction writers for sure. But I have noticed as someone who also freelances as a features writer, that there are fewer and fewer spaces to write in. Um, not just because print is the way that it is nowadays, mostly in diminishment, but also because funding for independent publications have, have really been reduced, if not cut out completely. So those kind of spaces are really lacking at the moment. Um, there's a few here and there, thankfully, mostly online, 
very few in print but i felt it i felt it as just a a, a features writer who actually cannot find spaces or is finding it very difficult to find spaces in which to place your work it's been shown the time outside but i ha i have so many questions for her i don't think we have the time but i do want to sort of bring us back to the book um so your book reads like a palindrome, right? So yes. it begins with this character, Shai, who yes. happens to be my favorite character in the book. I'm so glad. And then it goes, it keeps moving on. And I, I'll actually leave it to you to explain the structure. Yes. And then there's also like a whole book of poetry in the middle where you yes. come to your Linnaeus character and then you close it. So. Uh, what really struck me about the characters is also they seem to be on this quest and they seem to all be pursuing something and to me my interpretation of it was also like they were pursuing identity the idea of home in their own ways um, so do you want to go into that yes, a little bit of course I'm, I'm I'm happy to just share a little brief overview as they say um, of the book um, the book is structured in a very deliberate, nested way. I don't know um, if any of you have read David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas. It has a similar structure. So you begin with one story, you move on to the next, to the next, and then to the next, and that closes, and then you come round to the first set of stories again, right? So they open and close on either side of this middle story. So it's like the unfurling of a flower. It's like the rings of a tree, right? Or someone has called it a ham sandwich. Whichever works for you, honestly, <laughs> right? Um, so it's very deliberately structured in this way because these are stories that are set across centuries and across continents in very, very different parts of the world, in Europe, in, in, in Calcutta, in the northeast of India, in London, um, in Cambridge. So they're really sort of spread out across time, across continents, and yet they are all in some way or the other gently entangled. And how do you place that in a book? Right? That's the question that you ask yourself as a writer. How do you place these stories in a form, in an order in which they will resonate with each other in a way that's meaningful right? to the story and to you? Which is why they, f they, they, they follow this kind of nested, like a, a Russian doll. You know those the Russian dolls with one yes, with one doll inside another, inside another. So these stories are are cradled, one over the other, one over the other, and the story that embraces all stories, all of the other stories, is is the one that's that's following a character named Shy. And Shai, as I mentioned before, is someone who comes from the Northeast, who is facing almost similar existential questions that, that I do, really, that we do, perhaps. Um, but she encounters in her journeys, because they are all travelers, she encounters in her journey certain communities in the hills of the Northeast, in the hills of Meghalaya, who really do shift the way that she views the world, who really do transform her in this very, very, you know, um, uh, almost at a DNA level, right? Um, so that's why that's the story that cradles all of the other stories, because it offers that kind of space, right? Um, and at the, at the center, as uh, Pratibha mentioned, there is a narrative that's told entirely as poems. And um, I'll let you encounter it, hopefully, someday on your own. But this is a book that's questioning our, our, our great dependency on categories. We do it all the time, no? 
we say that person is this way, we are from here, they are from there. You know, we, we, we categorize along the lines of nation and gender and ethnicity and we're very good at boxing and labeling and putting things into these little shelves so that we understand the world in a certain way. But this book is urging you, perhaps not so gently, to throw those categories out of the window and see what then takes their place. If we offer the world a, ch a chance to be exactly as it is, what then does that mean for us as an individual, as a community, as even a species, right? What might that teach us? So the poetry functions as that moment of what? What's going on? Yeah? For you to suddenly encounter poetry in a book of prose, I hope makes you question, hang on, is this a novel? Has my understanding of what a novel is been perhaps a little too narrow? Perhaps my understanding of what a novel is or can be needs to be enlarged. And at a more cosmic level, everything perhaps that I think is true, what if it's not, right? <laughs> um, I just noticed the time up sign right there, but I was going to say, um, if we have, can we take at least one question? Is that okay? Yeah, I, I don't know if you have any questions for Janice, but yes. Um, Janice and hi. Prativa, hi, my name is Sabin, uh, I'm a researcher. Um, thank you for this uh, session, I found it to be uh, very calming and, uh, and engaging. Um, I would like to pick up where you left off in the end about what can a novel be uh, or what other forms uh, could it possibly take. Um, but I have a very specific purpose in asking this question and throwing it back at you. Um, but I need to set up a context first, and I'll be super efficient. I won't take more than a minute and a half, I promise. Um, so there is an, I, I come from Eastern Nepal, uh, from an indigenous community uh, that borders north, northeastern India. And there is an ongoing uh, indigenous movement against the construction of a cable car. So, um, and the cable car, if it happens, it's running on top of uh, what the limbus and rice call the sacred landscape. So the other day I was having tea with uh, one of the protagonists of the movement. He told me that had there been no mundhum, there would have been no movement. So mundhum is this indigenous document. It's a body of knowledge. And it's a ritual of storytelling that informs mortuary rituals, marriage unions, and so on and so forth. Mundum is also a document that talk a lot about dreams and trees that talk and rivers that carry stories and so on and so forth. And that is precisely why the mainstream dismiss it as anything but knowledge. So <laughs> my question to you is, as part of this thing that I'm doing on the side, I've taken up this little task of reinterpreting and rewriting Mundum so that it is legible to the mainstream uh, as a, just so it occurs some kind of legibility and credibility to the mundum, right? So hence what, it, what you said towards the end matters to me. So as a method, I'm beginning, I have, I am beginning to pick up uh, works of fiction such as yours. I might begin to read it very soon. That where trees talk, uh, where people and nature, it's not just about that relationship, but people is nature, right? I've started, I just picked up Interpretation of Dreams from Sigmund Freud. I don't read these books, never in my life. So it is all with that particular political project. That's my question to you, is how, what do you think of this thing that I have in my head where can a work good. such as yours accord some kind of legibility to a body or a document such as Mundhum? And if so, how? Gosh, I mean, that's a very difficult question because I am contextually not versed in, in, in you know, in the, the, the wonderful things that you speak about. Um, so I don't know if, if I'm really able to um, offer you uh, something of, of much use. But 
I feel as though if this is what you're doing because it's important to you and it is what drives, um, you know, um, uh, a certain um, passion in your life, then sometimes that's really where we need to begin. It's as simple as that. I mean, we write the things that we write and we create the art that we create because to begin with, it speaks to us at that very, very foundational level. It is important to us and it is important to us that at some point, this also becomes important to others around us, right? So sometimes we try and predict for ourselves and for our artworks what five years on, 10 years on will have in store. And sometimes I think actually our predictions are very limited. And if we don't make those predictions and if we just do what we do and we create the art that we create because we love to, then the possibilities of what happens to that artwork and what happens to you are endless. Perhaps what you're doing now is not just for you know, uh, for the sake of what you think it is. Perhaps its, it's, it's um, value is much, much larger. So perhaps we don't want to write these narratives for our art and for ourselves so preemptively because that might just narrow down the range of possibilities of what that artwork and what you can do. Thank you. Um, also, um, I don't see Ajit here, but I just wanted to say thanks to Nepal Literature Festival as well for um, creating this occasion to have Janice here. Um, and a very big thank you to each and every one of you um, sitting here in front of us. Yes, it re really you. meant a lot to us. And also, I just want to add, um, this is a great book to read. And <laughs> yeah, I, I recommend that. Um, you buy it from one of the stalls out there because uh, you should be able to find the book there, right? And then Janice is here, so you can also get her to sign it for you. Thank you for thank joining you, us. And thank you to all of you for sitting and listening with such patience. So sweet. Thank you.